All right, in this video, we'll be looking at cellular respiration. Uh, we'll be doing that over the next two videos, actually. Cellular respiration is a pretty complex process, but just like photosynthesis, we're going to be looking at a general overview of this process and kind of hitting the high points of understanding. So the um, big idea for cellular respiration is, as you can see here, it's basically the opposite process of photosynthesis, whereas in photosynthesis, we have an endo endergonic reaction where energy is being stored. In photo air and cellular respiration, we have that energy that is stored in that glucose molecule being broken down and energy is being released and for use. That would be a, a for use. That would be an extragonic reaction. And also just to note that there are two processes we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about cellular respiration and we're going to talk about another process called fermentation. Fermentation also allows organisms to use ATP or get, or get energy from a glucose molecule and create ATP. Um, these are two processes that can happen in all life forms. Um, and both of them are able to release energy. However, in cellular respiration, uh, oxygen is requirement for that process. Whereas in fermentation, oxygen is not required. In fact, it doesn't happen if there is oxygen present. And so, and to note, these are two separate reactions. We're going to talk about a process called glycolysis, which happens in all organisms, whether there's oxygen or not. And then if there's no oxygen, fermentation occurs. If there is oxygen, aerobic or cellular respiration occur. This word aerobic means with oxygen, as you can see here, Anaerobic is without oxygen, that anaerobic respiration. So for a brief overview of cellular respiration, cellular respiration occurs in three processes. And again, the big idea is that it breaks down glucose to make ATP. ATP represents an energy currency for the cell. Um, ATP is used by cells to do all sorts of cellular work. And because the energy stored in between the third and our second and third phosphate of that molecule almost acts like a little spring switch that turns processes on. And so you can see the different steps here in glycolysis. You have the breaking down of glucose to create pyruvate. Um, there's also, and this occurs in the cytoplasm of organisms, there's some ATP being made in this process and there's some um, electron carriers, which we'll talk about as well. Then you have um, a step called pyruvate oxidation, where pyruvate is broken down and oxidized, and which occurs in the mitochondria and leads directly into a process called the Krebs cycle, in which that product of pyruvate oxidation is further broken down, uh, occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, and CO2 is released as a byproduct, and more electron carriers are produced in this process. As you can see, ATP is also a product here, but is not very much. And then lastly, the electron transport chain, which happens in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, or for organisms that don't have a mitochondria, it will happen on the cell membrane. And the big thing, the big idea here is using those electron carriers to power chemiosmosis. Remember, chemiosmosis is the, um, the creating a proton gradient to power ATP synthase to make ATP through this process called oxidative phosphorylation. Now, that's a whole lot. So let's break that down in a little bit more uh, easier chunks to manage. So uh, this concept of the ETC is around again here. This is the electron transport chain. The purpose of the electron transport chain is to transfer energy from electrons to um, create a proton gradient so that ATP can be created. These reactions that occur are a series of oxidation and reduction actions or redox reactions, whereas these electron carriers are oxidized, basically giving up their electron and they, in doing so, those electrons power these proton pumps, which create a um, proton gradient inside this intermembrane space, and then allowing ATP to use that gradient through facilitated diffusion in order to create ATP. This process is what is called a conserved process. A conserved process basically means that this is something that occurs in all organisms. Uh, all organisms have this process in similarity. Uh, NADAH and FADH2 here are our electron carriers. Not sure if I mentioned that, so that's that's important. We'll mention those more later. So oxidative phosphorylation is a word I've used a couple times. What does that mean? This is when those high energy electrons uh, 
are donated to the electron transport chain through the process called oxidation. Phosphorylation is the third phosphate being added onto an ADP to create ATP. So oxidative phosphorylation oxidation is occurring here. Phosphorylation is occurring here. Another way you can think of it is this requires oxygen for those electrons to be dropped off, whereas because oxygen is the final electron acceptor. All right, this is an active process as well, so it requires the energy from those electrons because these protons are being pushed against the gradient into a high concentration area in order to maintain that gradient. That process, again, is called chemiosmosis. Notice you have a whole lot of other things here. Those whole lot of other things aren't very important. But the big idea here is that ADP and that inorganic phosphate, that was that little PI means, are combined together through this process to create an energy currency that can be used in multiple processes inside the cell. Now, there are instances in which this energy or this ATP may not need to be produced. Um, if, um, if there's too much ATP, the body only keeps certain amounts of ATP on hand, depending on the activity level. So let's say an animal is hibernating, for instance, and is at a very low activity level, and not a lot of ATP is going to be necessary. And so what can happen is a process called uncoupling in which the electron carriers are able to do their thing, but rather than ATP being made, there is a process here where heat is created. Basically, that excess energy is released as heat, which if you remember that process of releasing heat is basically uh, because of entropy that reactions will release heat as unusable energy. Well, in this case, that heat can be used to keep the animal warm during the cold months and to regulate body temperature. There's a, process, there's a chemical here that I don't have... Um, don't have listed here called uh, dinitrophenol DNP and that is the uncoupling um, the uncoupler chemical here what's interesting about DNP is it was actually used as a weight loss drug in the early 20th century with the idea being that you're using the energy that you you know you're basically using the food that you have but you're creating heat which would cause you to lose weight which happens to what, what happens to hibernating animals as well. Uh, it just so happens that this was an extremely dangerous drug, and so it was taken off the market in the 1930s. But just an interesting uh, mechanic there because, you know, something that is a natural process, science was able to grab a hold of it, but not to good use in that case. And so, again, uh, the idea here is that a hibernating animal or even animals at low activity levels can turn that energy into heat rather than creating unneeded ATP, which not would, would not be a good thing. And so um, big idea, this, this is electron transport chain dropping off. Normally, you would drop off those electrons to create the gradient to make ATP, but in this case, heat is created instead.